Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Roses are a great addition to any garden. Today, we're going to go over the basics of growing them. Also, crown, scarification, and chlorosis are terms you have heard, but what do they mean? We're going to define these gardening terms and more. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Bill Dickerson. Mr. Bill is our local road expert. And Dr. Kelly is here. Doc is our horticulture expert. Thanks Glad for joining us. You're welcome. Yep. All right, so Mr. Bill, we want to know about rose care. So let's start with pruning. Pruning. Typically, it used to be February, January, start cutting the canes back. Okay. Depending on the size of the cane, 12 to 16 inches, the bigger the cane, uh, you can take it up a little bit more. The smaller the cane, you want to cut them a little bit harder. Um, you want to get the dead wood out, and that kind of, and that's a system that makes it easier. You cut the dead wood out, then you cut the little spindly stuff out, mm -hmm. and so it kind of is a, is a pathway to see where you're at. And then you start, and you might have a eight foot bush, and next thing you know, you got a nub. Okay. <laughs> but they'll come back, <laughs> you know, the next year you do the same thing all over again. Okay. All right. And I used to hear people say, yeah, you should prune them in such a way that you can actually put a bowl. This is just true. sit a bowl in the middle of it. And that's pretty much the biggest disease is black spot, but that opens up and you get air. And it's like any shrub. It, you get air through the bush. So you want it to come up and you cut out the cross canes. So you want it open. Okay. Um, makes sense. Um, and that just makes a big difference. Okay. Now let's talk about the million dollar question we always get at the office. Fertilizing. I mean, what do we use to fertilize our roses with? There's, there's a lot of, like, um, Rose Tone, some companies that have a, for, a, a, a fertilizer formula. I pretty much use horse food. <laughs> Cottonseed meal. Mm -hmm. You can go to your co-op or some of your box stores, your nurseries. Alfalfa pellets. Uh, and that's just an organic that builds the soil and it's a slow release and it's still cold. And the good thing about pruning in, when it's cold in February is the thorns don't eat you alive. Oh, okay, yeah. If the, if the season changes and it gets hot and I'm out there instead of overalls and I'm in a t-shirt, I'm just bleeding. You know? Right, right. Just, um, I add Epsom salt, which is just a wonder, wonder drug in my opinion. Okay. I add about two tablespoons of Epsom salt. And then I'll add some urea or ammonia nitrate or something to kind of kick it in gear and, and then scratch that in. Okay. And then on the fertilizer, and then about you'll get your blooms in May, then I'll come back and uh, use a triple 13 or some of the organics and do those about in May. Mm -hmm. Then it gets hot and, you know, they're slowing down a little bit. Uh, then back in... Uh, September, you start fall fertilizing again for that big bloom in the fall. Okay. So your first bloom in the season is your biggest blooms. Okay. Your last is your, so your first and last is your biggest blooms. Right now when it's hot, you know, big rows will shrink down to, sure, sure. they just fall apart. Sure. Uh, but most of your, and then I'd say your nurseries, go to a reputable nursery. You can get some of these box stores. You can get a little $3 rose. It's like buying a $3 car. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. You know, you, you get what you pay for, right? And it's exactly okay. right. right. And you get a good quality rose, and the nursery <laughs> people can tell you what, what to recommend, and, and, and all of a sudden you'll have a lot better luck. Sure. Uh, um, bloom coat, some of those things, those slow release, triple 14s, those are good. You can just throw them out and rain or water and it gives you three months and, and that helps. Okay. Now let's say, since we're talking about the fertilizer, how about watering though? Because we got to get that watered in. So how often should we be watering our roses? Well, just about everything needs about an inch okay. a week. Most people kill roses by too much water uh -huh. than not enough water. Okay. Um, 
and you can just I hand water mine. Most of my most people have irrigation, but sure. you know an inch a week is is enough, okay. and they like dry feet. So if they get soggy, I dug a hole one time. Was going to plant a rose. And it filled up with water. <laughs> I'm not, like, this ain't gonna yeah, work. Not the right site for that. No. Okay. Then when you deadhead, after you prune in the spring, when you deadhead, you're just taking a rose in the house for mm -hmm. for a you know a bouquet, um, and then you want to cut off that spent bloom. Okay. Otherwise, it forms a rose hip, and then this, the 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 rose thinks it's done its job yeah. and produced, and it slows down. So if you you're manipulating, so you cut those rose hips off. Um, and then you'll get a bloom. And typically is something I was amazed, about every 40 to 45 days, once you cut a rose back, it takes that long to get a new cane wow. and another rose. All right. You know, when I first had that. roses, I had roses and I look out one day and there's no roses. All right. And I was just kind of in between a cycle. Now you'll have some floor bundles and some of those and you'll have some, but usually they all come in at the same time and go. Okay. So you want to just cut back to, um, and you want to always leave when you're pruning or deadheading. You want to, you know, a lot of people want these long stem red roses mm -hmm. to take in the house. Sure. Well, you've got a cane two foot long and they leave it an inch and a half. They don't leave much to work with. Wow. That rose has got to just start all over again. Okay. Uh, so you want to leave at least two sets of leaves. And the old rule of thumb is, is when you're deadheading, is cut back to a five leaf. Okay, good. I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. Um, at the top of the rows, you'll have a one and a two. But the reason being is you're going further down the cane. You want, if with a good strong bush, you want pencil, pencil thin, a pencil sized cane. Okay. If you cut up the top, it'll bloom at the top, but you get a little rose and it's heavy and it's piddly is what my mother used to call it. <laughs> um, so you just do that and then you take your bouquets in the house, you know, and- uh, oh, That's nice. Now while we have a little time left, let's go back and talk a little bit about black spots. So how do you get rid of black spots? Well, there's some chemicals that you can use and that's the biggest thing about roses. Mm -hmm. You'll get a black yes, spot, um, the leaf will turn yellow, the leaf will fall off. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, I'm not getting any blooms. <laughs> well, it doesn't have any leaves on it. Right. And that's the lifeblood of the plant. Sure. Um, most of your, and I was astounded when I first learned this, most of your sprays for black spot is a preventative. Mm -hmm. So once you've got black spot, you might as well just pick it off and throw it in the garbage can. Right. Practice good sanitation. Right. Um, so there's some sprays that you can spray. Most of them are every week. Uh, uh, you can get online and there's some sprays that'll go over two weeks. Uh, there's some products out that work pretty good that you just spread a granular okay. around the base and it's got fertilizer and right. some pesticides. And, but that's the main health of a rose is good leaves. Um, and if there's no leaves, there's no blooms. So, right. and you have to be diligent. So if you go on vacation and you come back and all your roses have black spot, you just got to wait to cycle out and they'll, they'll put on new leaves and, but you've just lost, you know, you lost some valuable rose time. Especially if you have a lot of, you know, wind and rain. Yeah. Uh, it's Rainy definitely going to, you know, spread yeah. those spores all over the place, which is why it's a good idea to mulch your roses. Don't you agree? Oh, mulch is, you know, whether it's your roses or it's your tomatoes. <laughs> You know, it's the ground's hot. When you fertilize, it, it's, it's keeping it in the ground and, it, and the ground doesn't get so hard. Um, and it just, one, it keeps the spores from popping up on the plant. Okay. Um, and two, it just conserves, like today, it's probably gonna be 95. It just conserves moisture in the ground. Sure. Uh, so I, you can tell when somebody's got mulch and and some people are stingy with they mulch. If, they, if they've got a little bit on the ground and they can see it and it looks good, it's not doing any good. Right. <laughs> I mean, you want two or three inches of mulch. Sure. <laughs> um, I use hardwood mulch. A lot of people use the pine products. The only thing about hardwood mulch is you've got to break it up because sure. it'll turn water. But it, you know, the plants love it. It keeps the bugs off of them. It keeps the spores off of them and helps with the black spot. All right, Mr. Bill, we appreciate the information about Rose Care. Well, thank you. Thank you. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you.
All right, Doc. I like when you do these. <laughs> these are gardening terms, right, that we often hear. Yeah. And some folks might not know what they actually mean. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, and some of them kind of sound a little bit strange. And they, they think, ooh, what does that mean? Like double meanings and stuff. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Well, <laughs> you ready to get into it? Sure. This is always fun. All <laughs> right. So here's our first gardening term. How about blight? blight. We say blight. All yeah. the, especially blight. dealing with tomatoes, right? We yeah. always say blight. Oh, yeah. So, got the blight. The blight. Oh, I got the blight. <laughs> what can we do about the blight? You know? Yeah, it's a bad thing. It's definitely, I mean, you can just tell the way people say it, blight. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it's a, bad, it's a bad thing. And it can either be referring to a particular disease. Okay. We have a late blight, early blight on tomatoes. Or it could just, when you use the word blight, it could refer to actually the injury mm. on the leaf. So it could be a disease or the injury that is caused by diseases that are blights. What happens is it could be a spot, that could be the injury. It could be a lesion. It could be anything, or it could be even death. You know, blight very definitely can cause, some of the bad ones can cause uh, eventually death of the plant. So it's a bad thing, you know, and if you've got blight, you need to do something to try to remedy the blight. And right. as you say, fungicides are, is the way to go because most of the blights are caused by fungi and most of our fungicides are only preventive. They're not curative. And okay. the idea is to get it out there and get the foliage covered and the blossoms and the fruit. So it depends on exactly which blight we're trying to control, but okay. yeah, it's a bad it's, thing. It's a bad thing, fungi. It's a bad thing, okay. yeah. Our next term is crown. Okay. Crown, okay, well, most people would think that's what the queen's got on her head, <laughs> but <laughs> with gardeners, the, the crown of a plant is the point where the stems meet the roots. It's, in other words, right there at the soil mm -hmm. level, that's the crown, and it's where roots turn into stems or stems turn into roots. And in a perennial, of course, it'd be fleshy, and in a tree or something else like that, it'd be woody. So it's just that junction okay. of uh, that transition area. All right, so that's the crown. That's the crown. It's not All what right. the king or the queen <laughs> wears on their head, but our crown, we used to, when we were kids, we'd crown each other. That means you just bop each other in the head with your fist. I'm going to crown you. The crown. Yeah, I'm going to crown you. Put a knot on your head. <laughs> so here's our next gardening term, green manure. Yeah, Ooh, that yeah. One a lot, right? that's Especially not right, right manure. Right. I mean, it's yes, yeah, not right yet. No <laughs> green manure. Of course, you okay. hear that a lot. You know, in vegetable gardens. You do, you do very much so. Right. And uh, that is a kind of an old thing. It's been around a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Farmers practiced it way back generations mm -hmm. ago, and it was uh, a, a crop that you would grow that usually was one of the legumes, mm -hmm. which have the nitrogen fixing, you know, ability. Mm -hmm. So what it does is you grow this crop, and it can be a cover crop. You know, a lot of green manure and cover crop doesn't necessarily mean the same thing because cover crops can be not green manures, just cover crops okay. to prevent erosion and things like that or to break up hard soils. But a green manure crop is grown specifically to grow and turn back into the soil for its manure or nutritive, you know, properties. And it's mainly legumes like clover, um, vetch, hairy vetch right. yeah, hairy vetch, mm -hmm. uh, alfalfa. beans, yeah, alfalfa, alfalfa. exactly. Right, sure. You know, bean crops, all of those could be used as uh, green manure green. crops. Yeah, like that. So that's your green manure. Yep. All right. How about this gardening term? Big term, scarification. Yeah, yeah. That's one that we hear sometimes in reference to seeds. Mm -hmm. There's scarification and there's stratification. Scarification is a way to weaken, open, or abraze a hard seed coat because some of our seeds will not germinate because for a length of time until that seed coat degrades in some way. Now, if you're in a gardener, you can hasten that by scarification. Mm -hmm. And mainly the way we do it is mechanical. You can take a file, you can mm -hmm. take a knife, but what you're doing is you're just scraping or abrasing that seed coat to weaken it, weaken it so that moisture can get in there and it can germinate. Okay. And that's scarification. You can also do, do it chemically, you know, with sulfuric acid and things like that, but I wouldn't recommend that yeah. for the home yeah. garden. I don't know about the home folks, right? <laughs> but I have definitely, you know, like beans, bean sure. seed is an example, canna seeds, uh, morning glory family seeds, nasturtium, anything that's got a, a hard seed coat would benefit by scarification. All right. How about this one? And I hear the old timers say this, sour 
versus sweet. Yeah, yeah. you're right on it, Chris, <laughs> because that is an old time term. <laughs> And those are terms used okay. to describe the alkalinity or acidity of the soil, the pH. In other words, the pH. pH. Right. And when I got to reading up on it, I found out that it originated when the pioneers crossed the United States going westward to determine where their best home site was. Huh. They would actually taste the soil. How about that? Yeah, and I hadn't tried that yet. I was going to do it. I'm like, no, I'm not even going to do that even for Chris Cooper. I'm just not going to eat dirt. But it said that you could tell the alkalinity or the acidity of a soil by the, you know, the, the, the way your taste buds reacted, and a sweet soil would be more alkaline. Go wow. figure. Yeah. How about that? That's yeah, amazing. and it's sweet meaning that it would... Um, well, be sweet as opposed to sour, which would be like a uh, a fizzy. And one, I did read up where one guy actually did it, and he said that a really acidic soil or a sour soil would taste like uh, those, uh, what's that candy? Those rocks that blow up in your mouth, that little candy that's fizzy, really the, fizzy. Yeah, the so it would be fizzy. Yeah. Okay, I think yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. and it said an alkaline candies. soil okay. or a sweet soil would be like taking a dose of milk or magnesia. Wow. Yeah, okay. coke chalky. Okay. It okay. kind of coats your tongue. Mm. So I'm just taking their word for it. Ah, good deal. Okay. That was, that was good. Okay. How about this next one? We hear this one all the time. Wet feet. <laughs> yeah. Wet, wet feet. feet. Yeah. And you mentioned that in your mm. rose culture thing about when you dug the hole and it filled up with water. Mm -hmm. Most plants do not like what we call wet feet. And that soil, <laughs> whether it's in the ground or in a container, that is continually wet and soppy, what we call soppy. I don't know if that's a real word or not, but I believe it is. But, <laughs> you know, unless it. they're a bog plant or an aquatic plant, most plants do not do well with wet feet. And that's just a term we use to refer to a waterlogged soil. Waterlogged yeah. soil, wet yep. feet. Yep. Good stuff, we appreciate that as always. <laughs> it's good stuff. No problem. So we are in the garden, we're looking at this tomato plant. I think we may have possible tomato hornworm damage. As you can see here, the leaves have been eaten off. And something else you can do, you can actually look for the fecal material. And guess what? There's some right there. That lets me know a tomato hornworm is near. And there it is, the tomato hornworm. As you can see the horn, hence the name tomato hornworm. I've been doing a lot of damage here. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna get out the sprayer. Uh, it has BT product in it. Uh, javelin, a uh, dipel is what you can use. Again, the active ingredient is BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, make sure that you spray your tomato plant, get good coverage. And what happens is the tomato hornworm is gonna eat the foliage. Once he eats the foliage, it's gonna give him a stomach ache and he's gonna die. All right, here's our Q&A session. You jump in there with us, Mr. Bill, if you have something to say, <laughs> all right? Here's our first viewer email with a picture. I was pulling weeds around my peanut plants today and ran across several of these green caterpillars in the soil. What are they and what should I do about them? And this is our friend, Mr. Mike in Ringo, <laughs> Georgia. All right, Mr. Mike, alfalfa caterpillar is what that is, right? Because I, they, yeah, they actually hang around, you, yeah. they hang around soybean. They do. And when he mentioned, peanuts. of course, peanuts, I was like, aha. That's a legume. Okay. It's a legume. Yeah. Right? Soybeans is a legume, and this thing feeds on legumes. Feeds on yeah. legumes, right? Yeah. Yeah, so alfalfa caterpillar. But yeah. here's the deal. can cause major damage to alfalfa because this caterpillar, mm -hmm. instead of just eating chumps out of the leaf, it can eat the entire leaf. Now, if you want to get rid of it, it's a caterpillar. BT. BT. Yeah. BT. So yeah. diapel, javelin. Right, you third know, side, if it's still there. Third side, there. right, yeah. if it's still there. Use that, Mr. Mike, better kill your problem. Right. But you know what, beautiful uh, butterfly. I think it's like, I saw a picture of it, it's like yellow, purple, really? and white. Mm. It's the alfalfa butterfly. Okay, hmm. All right. I didn't see that. But yeah, I kind of thought it was either that or something else, and I wasn't sure, so you got yeah. that one. Yeah, it's the peanut, you know, it's plant kind of gave it away. It's a peanut caterpillar. So <laughs> there you have it, Mr. Yeah. Mike, thanks for that question. <laughs> All right, here's our next viewer email. Can you help me by identifying this type of grass? It's taking over my football field. How do I get rid of it? And this is Mr. Craig. He's the football coach of Middleton High School. Uh-oh. How about that? It's a you know something about thing, Middleton? Then, yeah. yeah, he's the football coach. So what kind of grass do we think that is? I right? thought it was crabgrass. 
but I don't know. I'm not a turf expert, you know, a weed expert, but it looked kind of like crabgrass. Crabgrass it is. Okay. okay. Crabgrass, of course, you know, grows in clumps. It does. Or bunches. That's what kind of spreads out. Looks kind like a little crab out. with its, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Kind of looks like that a little bit. Uh, compact soils. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's football, definitely. Right, yeah. that's football, right? I play football on that field, so, by the yeah. way. So that would be crabgrass, okay? Uh, again, compact soils, soils that actually hold a lot of moisture, is what crabgrass likes. Now, I usually start culturally, okay? So I usually tell folks, you know, you got to fertilize according to your soil tasks. You know, you know how this yeah, goes, yeah, Doc, yeah. okay? Make sure you're cutting and mowing at the right, right height, height, okay? Right. Yeah. Aeration is yeah. important. Okay, watering deeply, but infrequently. Those are your cultural practices. Now, with that being said and done, how do you get rid of it chemically? Is oh, probably yeah. what he wants to know, right? Right. There's a couple of ways, right? So there's a couple of ways. Do you yeah. know a couple of those ways? Well, I think there's pre-merge you can use, okay. and then there's post-emergent herbicides. Pre-merge would be to get it before it germinates mm -hmm. in the spring, and uh, there's chemicals that do that, you know, that, are, that, uh, that do that. And then there's the post-emergent. Which, and I believe they're, I'm sure it's a Bermuda turf, right? Would you like suspect? It. Probably, yeah. So there are so. herbicides you could spray over Bermuda that will target crabgrass. Right. So, you know, he would just need to check and talk to a reputable dealer or, mm -hmm. or the extension service, right. county office. Right. Down there in Hardin County? Can, yeah, and they sure. can lead him in the right direction with that. Yeah, yeah. pre-emergence is very important. It needs to go down late February, early Yeah, so March. he's missed that time. So he can hit that. it next February, though. Right, dimension yeah. is something that we recommend. Mm -hmm. Pendulum is something that's recommended as well. Uh, the commercial guys use barricade, which is prodiamine. Yeah. But, you know, post-emerge would be <sighs> quinclorac. That's right. I yes, didn't know how yeah. That's exactly that's what that right. Is. Yep. But, you know, Mr. Chris, since you're a football coach, maybe, you know, somebody can help you, yeah. you know, get the post emerge that you would need in bulk supply. Exactly. Right. And it's football season is six weeks away. So yeah. He needs so you got to hurry up. Yeah. Yeah. So there you have it, Mr. Craig. We appreciate that question. <laughs> Good luck to the team. All right. Go Tiger. Here's our <laughs> next via email. I bought several small pots of chrysanthemums. They are supposed to bloom <laughs> in the fall. My chrysanthemum started blooming in April. Yeah. Is this because of the weird weather? And this is from Miss Ruth. So they're supposed <laughs> to bloom in the fall. But they yep. came up in April. You're, you think that, don't you? <laughs> you, that you, that, right? you always typically think of mums <laughs> as the fall blooming sure. plant. But sure. with humans, we don't let stuff alone. Oh. So some of the new, and, and see, for a plant to bloom in the fall, that's a condition we call it's a photoperiodic plant. Uh -huh which means that flowering <laughs> is based on daylight hours, or more particularly night hours, but short days. In the fall, our days get shorter, right? Right. So that triggers a lot of our plants to say, okay, fellas, it's short days, we gotta bloom. You mm -hmm. know, we gotta do our stuff before it gets cold weather. So a mum, in its natural way, was a short day plant and bloomed in the fall. But you know, the floral industry got a hold of them, <laughs> uh -oh. and now they've come out with what we call day neutral. In other words, they bloom no matter what. Right. Oh my goodness. Okay. And, they're all, and they'll bloom in the spring, they'll bloom in the summer, and they'll bloom in the fall. And some of them will just go in and out of bloom all the time. But I suspect what happened to hers is they were grown obviously in a greenhouse, okay? Subjected to short days probably in that greenhouse which triggered them to flower because when they get their number of hours, you know, below a certain day length or night length, they're gonna flower no matter what. How about that? So she brought them out like a poinsettia. Okay. You know? Okay. They That's brought them example. out and they, right. okay, we're going to flower. So tell her not to worry about it. They'll just okay. get back right next summer. Or get new ones. <laughs> yeah. I planted some at church one <laughs> fall, you know, for, for Halloween. And the next, you know, they did okay. And the next spring, I mean, they just greened up and they bloomed in the spring and they, yeah. they were, I just, I couldn't yeah. dig them up. <laughs> Or, and, and they're huge now. Yeah, okay. yeah. And that's, I mean, that's fine. Right. I mean, you know, just she can enjoy them in the spring and they may bloom again. Or if she doesn't like them blooming in the spring, she always pinches them buds right. off. Right, yeah. yeah. Just pinch the buds off just and keep they'll be fine. pinching them. Right. But quit pinching them like, you know, like by now. Because right. if she keeps pinching them on into August, she's going to pinch off her flower yeah, buds. Yeah, it, it's fall. too late at that point. Yeah. All right. So there you have it, Miss Ruth. Okay. Not too much of the real weather. Just day neutral. Yeah, day could neutral. be. Could, could be, be one neutral. of those that is, yeah. New word. All right, yeah. 
No guard turns there. <laughs> and settle in. <laughs> settle so don't in. put that on your turn list. We're going to find that one. Yeah. All right, Mr. Bill, Dr. Kelly, we're out of time. It's been fun. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Every week we don't get to answer all the viewer questions on TV, but we do answer them and post them online at familyplotgarden.com. The questions we did not answer are at the bottom of the home page. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.